Hello, I'm David Holbrook, Festival Director of Mountain Film and Telluride. I'm sitting here with Roger Cohen, columnist for the New York Times and an International Herald Tribune. Roger, great to have you back at Mountain Film. Again, third time, right? Third time. Why the hell do you keep coming better, back? It gets Does better every time. Excellent. Thanks for having me back, David. What, what draws you back? I mean, you're all over the world. You live in London. And I say, hey, Roger, you want to come to Telluride? I mean, hey, that's an easy question. But yeah, yeah. what draws you to Mountain Film specifically? I think it's a very unique uh, atmosphere. It's intimate. At the same time, there's a lot of idealism. Uh, all the talks seem to me to be very animated and full of energy. And uh, you know, I deal mainly with international relations, and we're right in the middle of the U.S. here. And maybe some of the people here don't travel that much, but I sense an enormous interest in the outside world. And and then you're just in this um, incredibly beautiful place. Well, uh, and what I hope is that this incredibly beautiful place engenders ideas, conversation, action, and, and you know, you're going, imagine, you know, you're going to Davos, or you're going to uh, these big conferences, right. and, and the sensibility here is so much different. Do you, do you feel coming to a place like this that things are getting done? I do. I feel like... Um there's a lot of debate about uh, important issues, and uh, it's not everybody in a suit and tie and, uh, you know, a lot of hedge fund guys. It's, uh, uh, you know, we're in, in this place of immense beauty, so inevitably there's a lot of talk about the environment. I saw a movie yesterday, uh, Drive in Uranium, Drive in Uranium, right? Dri uranium, uranium Drive, drive in, in, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's just fascinating, I think, seeing, you know, Telluride, which has become quite a wealthy place, and then this other you know, village, nuclear, just across the way where the conditions of the economy are very different. So, you know, how do these two Americas coexist? And uh, I was talking mainly about Middle Eastern issues and uh, drone warfare and issues that are quite a long way from Telluride. But uh, again, I thought there was a lot of, a lot of interest and, and animation. The, uh, we've played in three films this year. We brought you in to be a part of a conversation around Dirty Wars, Manhunt, and uh, which, way which, way, front line? which way is the front line, mm. the Tim Hetherington story. And, and I, I think putting those three together, we, we had a particularly tough afternoon of programming, our yeah. you know, second half of the day of those lined up. But I think they give, they're companion pieces. Yeah. They're looking at, I guess, what was called at one point, may still be the global war on terror. Right. Well, I think it's no longer, as of this week, called the Global War on Terror because yeah. the president made a speech in which he said he wanted to bring the Global War on Terror to an end. So it was a great weekend, in a way, to have that debate. And these movies were all looking at different aspects of uh, drone warfare. What's happened to the U.S. and the world in the last dozen years since 9-11? And the president, in essence, had just said we cannot go on forever renewing this authorization for the use of military force that was passed right after 9-11 and which gave the U.S. pretty much license to wage war in the world wherever it wanted. And, um, you know, I thought Manhunt in its way, just chronicling the whole hunt for bin Laden, ultimately successful. Again, you know, in the history of the CIA, how will this be regarded? Uh, will it be regarded as a, as a moment of success in that it did end with uh, killing of Osama bin Laden and identifying where he was? Or will it be regarded as a very dark chapter in the history of the CIA because of everything that went on on the dark side, the black sides, the torture, the waterboarding? And um, I think these movies in different ways, you know, explored all these issues. And the conversations afterward with uh, former CIA uh, Officers and uh, the movie, yeah, analysts uh, just made it fascinating. Well, the the CIA and has has been its own flux, really. Yeah. Since nine eleven, huge, and huge, and it seems like in a way they're almost reverting. They're coming back to who they, or that seems to be the new plan. Yeah, I think there's a sense that nine eleven disoriented each of us. I mean, I'm in the press, you know, and I'm at the New York Times. And, and you were living and in, in New York at the yeah, time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it, there's no question that in the lead up to the war in Iraq, uh, in the press, we failed to question sufficiently the grounds for that war. And we have to examine that in our consciences, just as I imagine CIA analysts, officers, have to ask, uh, you know, as General McChrystal said in one of the movies, it's, it's very dangerous doing what we did, because once you've done it once, it's easy to do it a second time. 
And then what happens to our guys when they get captured? And you know, if we can send flying robots over any country in the world to drop bombs on people, uh, I mean, what would it be like to have one in the sky, you know, the blue can, sky? Can right you imagine? Here? No, and, and I think they are starting to be used domestically. There's talk of them. Yeah. And that, that brings up Big Brother and all these other things. But let's stick to the, uh, to the international scene. Yeah. Um, with Manhunt, what, that, what I took away from that film was we had a... Sh sh Bin Laden was trouble. People knew it. Mm -hmm. And yet the people who knew it and were shouting from the rooftops were kind of ignored until... September 11th or September 12th, and then they were vilified. Is, is that, do, you, do you think that's... Well, the first third of the movie was about that, and that was really fascinating, especially because most of the analysts, it turned out, were women. Were women. And uh, there was this pretty strong suggestion in the movie that there was <clears throat> an element of sexism in the dismissal of the analysis from these women. It was saying, Osama bin Laden has attacked us in Africa. He's attacked us in Kenya. Yemen. He's attacked us in Yemen. Uh, he's attacked the USS Cole. And he says he's going to attack the United States. And we think he may actually mean it. And nobody really focused on that. And I mean, look, Boston, the Russians, who are not in the habit of helping the United States, Moscow tells us this guy, this kid, is trouble. is trouble. And, you know, after a perfunctory interview or something, now look, you know, 2020 hindsight is, um, makes everything seem easy, but um, we do need a lot of vigilance. On the other hand, we don't need a nation on a permanent war footing. There is no way we can preserve our freedoms well, if we are on a permanent war footing where the president is ordering attacks in parts of the world. There is no public debate. And, and there's no limits. It seems, I mean, that's what dirty wars, you know, my, my takeaway yeah. from dirty wars is, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope, and we didn't know really what was going on. Uh, we know more now what was going on, and the president just said he's declassified uh, everything that happened with respect to the killing of four Americans, three, three of them inadvertently, collateral damage, if you like, not that that's any consolation no, to their families, and one targeted, or lackey. And, uh, you know, these are... I think we'll be coming to terms with all this over a, over a pretty extended period, but I do, I certainly hope that um, this festival coincided with uh, a turning of the page. I mean, the president seems to have concluded that we, only at our peril could we continue down the path we've been on. You know, one thought I had reading that speech, I didn't get to listen to it at the time, but I wish he'd made it, uh, you know, two, three years back. Um, but, but he it, couldn't have because he was going into an election and yeah, he couldn't exactly, be yeah. soft on terror. That's and right. And, and now he has a And why did we, you know, why did we bump up to 100,000 troops in Afghanistan? A lot of Marines got killed. I think mainly because in the 2008 campaign, he couldn't afford to look like a wimp because he was pulling out of Iraq. So he had to say, we're going to double down in Afghanistan. And I know, for example, that your father... Sure. Uh, Richard Holbrook was very uneasy uh, about that um, troop surge um, in Afghanistan, which and I think in the end proved to be pretty uh, fruitless. I think that's right. And, and, and I know from my father, he, he felt the sol solution was a combination of, of different ways to get at this, but particularly diplomatically. Yeah. And that it seemed a lot easier to throw troops, to throw weapons, to throw drones. Right. Have this problem rather than to throw creativity and ingenuity and 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 some sort of long term diplomatic solution well, I think your dad knew better than anybody that in the end there is no end to a war without uh, some kind of uh, diplomatic you know, without an outright victory on one side, which is not going to happen in this case because we 've been at war with terror uh, you you can't you know you can't fight uh, you can't fight a uh, a strategy. I mean, there's no identifiable enemy. So, and in diplomacy, as your dad knew, it's, it's not pretty. You know, you, no. what you're asking the question, what do I want and what do I have to give to get it? You have to compromise. And he was ready, I think, to begin a conversation with the Taliban, to look at the big picture, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, try to build trade links between the, you know, do some creative things. And, and I would say on a scale of one to 10, the support that he got from the White House on that was about two. Yeah, 
uh, if not negative two. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, it may have been even more yeah. so. <laughs> so. I think two on that scale means negative two. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about uh, which way is the front line from here, the Tim Heatherings in the yeah. story. You knew Tim. I didn't actually know thought, him personally. No, I, 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 I mean, no, I, pass, maybe, I was actually in Benghazi I, I knew you in Libya Libya when, when I was thinking time. about getting a boat into Misrata and then um, decided I, not to. I, I think I was reading your byline from Libya. Yeah. He died. I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, no, we oh, were, crap, Roger, please be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but I thought, I thought it was a fantastic movie. I mean, I, I thought it really captured this um, very creative um, this rather beautiful sensibility that he had and was able to capture in images that certainly went beyond journalism into the realm of art, by which I mean speaking about the human condition in some lasting way. And uh, I thought war was very well captured as I've experienced it in that movie, the, the adrenaline rush, the, the boredom, the, the way in which people are revealed completely, all barriers are down, the difficulty of emerging from war into some form of everyday life, keeping your personal life together, um, you know, the fascination. And Tim was, uh, you know, at the end of the film it was so tantalizing because he was on the cusp, obviously, or f seemed like he was on the cusp of beginning a new phase of his life. He was in a very committed relationship and he, he went to Miss Rata almost uh, on a whim, you know, a, a kind of last minute thing. This huge thing was happening in Libya and he wanted to witness it. And there were two things about him that spoke to me particularly. One was, of course, bearing witness. For all the changes in journalism in my lifetime, it's been completely transformed by the emergence of a hyper-connected world and digital media. But there is no substitute for having your boots on the ground. Uh, and the other thing is it, it takes time to tell, a sto uh, to tell a story. It takes a long time. You have and to invest. In your yeah, thing. and Tim, Tim was a guy, you know, there was a line there at the end of the war in Liberia, I'm going to stay on for a couple of years. I mean, I found that absolutely right. astonishing. When everybody else pulls out Everybody else out pulls town. out, everybody else forgets about it. You know, he wanted to see the aftermath because he was invested not only in the country, but yeah, in these people. The people. And similarly in Afghanistan, um, why was the story from that valley in eastern Afghanistan? Restrepo. Restrepo, and uh, you know, why was it so unique and extraordinary? Because they spent weeks, months with these guys and really got inside their lives. Um, a woman came up to me afterward and said, you know, it's interesting, he focused very much on, on on men, um, and you know that was one issue I hadn't I hadn't particularly thought about. But Restrepo, you know, but it, it 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 was I thought that was an interesting little sidebar on him. But he was an amazing guy. Last question: You put those three films together, mm. and you knowing your own world view. What do you take away from those three as as a collective? Well, I. Uh, you know, I take away um, on the one side um, something rather hopeful. Uh, you know, I think for all the tragedy of, of Tim's end, you know, he was somebody deeply invested in the transformations that bring freedom into people's lives. And these are not simple transitions, they take generations, but you know, Libya was a country that you couldn't even pronounce anybody else's name except Gaddafi's. When there was commentary on a, on a soccer match on TV, it was player seven passing, passing to player nine because nobody be, could become a star, you know, nobody could threat. And, and what was happening in Misrata was this extraordinary wave of, of liberation in the Arab world. Now, it's very troubled, it's very difficult. Uh, Islam, Islamic parties are trying to reconcile themselves with the responsibility of governance. They've got to put food on the tables now. They can't just shout. So, but I, I, I retain a hopeful message from that. Um, from the rest, um, I, I think the U.S. lost its compass in the last dozen years. There's no question. We lost our compass after 9-11. Uh, the invasion of Iraq was a mistake. Uh, and uh, I feel like th this was an extraordinary moment to, to hold the festival and show these movies because they demonstrated the ways in which um, the global war on terror, uh, it was this, you know, as is, as is shown 
uh, very much in Dirty Wars. It was this voracious beast that kept feeding on itself and growing bigger and bigger. And because its boundaries were never clear, uh, the beast kept growing. It, it was all devouring in a way by the, by the end. And uh, there were, you know, there have been bombs dropping here and there that we, we've just not known much about. Um, and some kind of correction to that is needed, and I think it's happening now. On the other hand, uh, you know, core Al-Qaeda is not what it was a dozen years ago. It has been largely dismembered. And I think, we, we, we don't know, but I think the kind of attack you saw in Boston, where it's basically two Couple kids freelancing, uh, you know, kind of borrowing the ideology that's out there on the web, that's very different from a plot that killed 3,000 people. I'm not saying, I mean, obviously what happened in Boston of was course. unconscionable and, and terrible. But some solo actors It's, it's of a different scale. So I think we, we face a different threat today. We have realized the ways in which we need to change our approach away from the global war on terror. We're not there yet, but we're making that change. And meanwhile, in, in the Arab world, there is, a, there is a painful, difficult, but in my view still, ultimately hopeful transformation underway. Uh, uh, that's a nice place to end it. Roger thank Cohen, thank you so much for being thank, here on Minds of Mountain Film, and uh, yeah. we'll get you back soon. Thank you, David. Thanks, Roger.